time. There we go. So, welcome back to Radio Free Fredonia. I have my beautiful sidekick, Lady Sticks. I have our guest, Brad, and Mr. Pink. Mr. Pink is officially a guest tonight. Take that, Mr. Pink. Well, I am this is what happens when you... You're never showing up again. (laughs) (laughs) What? You love us. We love you. It's great. So it's okay, Mr. Pink. You can be a silent guest if you want. You can. But it's more fun when you talk. So last week, if you'll remember, Lady Sticks, Michael was on and we were talking about NPCs. And the topic was kind of motivation and backstory, and we were very big into motivation. And I think backstory yes. drives motivation. But we didn't get to talk a lot about backstory. So I thought we would harass Brad and talk about backstory. If we don't, Brad and I are just going to look at pictures of Big Boy. And we will be amused. I don't know if you and, and Mr. Pink would be. I haven't had a chance yet to see some of the videos, but I, I, I've been told, from what I understand, their whistles and they're loud. But yeah, I'm, I'm into motivation. I mean, Big Boy is awesome as well, but we should probably let people know who and or what Big Boy is. Um, which, Brad, do you want to fill that in? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Big Boy is Union Pacific's massive uh, live steam locomotive. It is the Currently, the largest operating live steam locomotive left in the world. So, so you you are not referring to the restaurant with the giant statue that you could hit a button with. No, correct. Oh <laughs> damn! I was so off on Big Boy. And this Although is why you're a guest. The restaurant had a whistle. I think come up with a rock and backstory with both of those big boys and figure out how to rock, play a character based off of them. So, shall we get started on backstory? So, Brad, I have a backstory type of question for you. When, when you're doing your NPCs, do you do backstories for all, almost all, or only like your major bad guys? Or do you not do any backstories? So will, do you think it, I mean. I will tend to give some backstory elements to pretty much anybody that I. Even if it doesn't. And in something for me to mentally latch on to. And regardless of, you know, how much of it actually shows up, in, you know, in the game or in print or wherever it goes, uh, you know, it, it none of it may ever actually be relevant. But I, uh, but I just for how my mental capacity works, I always have something to let my mind latch on to. The more prominent and important and you're going to come up with, the more detailed that's going to be. What's the, well, like, I mean, Lady Sticks, I know you don't GM as much, but you do GM and you have in the past. What about you? Oh, absolutely. I, so most of my NPCs, I have like vague ideas of backstories, mostly to help with motivation. So things like, it's a tragic backstory. Whatever the backstory is, it's tragic. Or it's an adventure backstory. You know, I must go explore, whatever. But I, I have a tendency mostly to focus my backstory on my characters that I play. Um, because it, I, I think that it really does drive um, motivation. But also because it helps me figure out who that character is. Um, And there have been times definitely when I'm working up NPCs where that is a situation. The NPC exists because I need to get a backstory into a game. And so the easiest way to do that is to create an NPC who has a backstory and then insert that NPC in so that it's a um, 
pre-set up scenario of look you meet and then you learn these facts or this information or something like that does that make sense you get the map because they're dying because they failed at the quest or whatever all right mr pink what about you I think, yeah, I, I think my statement just covered it, didn't it? Well, I, I like your yeah. statement. If they, if I, in case someone's just listening and they can't see the screen, if they have, oh, if, the, have you read the it. Statement more or less said. Anyone who's got plot armor has backstory. Yeah. So there, there, there are there are drones you can just you know literally murder hobo kill and there are things that are important so i think it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg conversation what comes first the motivation or the backstory um for me it depends on what i need to get across especially if it's an npc um, if it's a character, it's always the backstory that comes first before my motivation. Um, because they might have multiple motivations depending upon what their backstory is. But if it's an NPC, it's always, uh, it's kind of almost the other way around, is um, motivation and then uh, backstory. Again. Unless... As Mr. Pink stated, like they're they're murder hobo type things. They're dying on the way while they're leaving a clue because they're not that important a character to figure it all out. But I like to hear from Brad, especially. I was gonna say, what about you, Brad? <laughs> yeah, I was say, my my focus is what's the story that I'm looking to tell. I, I figure out where the story is going, what direction it's going to head. Then I fill in okay, these characters I need to fill these particular spots, and then I figure out how did they get to that point, and that's where the backstory comes in from there. Mr. Pink, uh, I'm so what I'm typing right now is listen to Brad. Setting is important. Got it. So one of the questions that I have, especially for Brad and other writery types, is. Do you find that canon helps with backstory, or do you find that backstory helps create canon? Does that oh, that's a good one. It I like depends that on the it depends on the context, and I'll throw it back at you just to, to clarify a little more where you're, you're looking to get. Are you talking about? Like canon for the game line in a in your particular game, or are you talking more? I think for canon establishing for, that canon. I think canon for eighteen seventy nine. I mean, as the line developer, because I know that there are NPCs in the game. Yeah, I I would say Man. like for when you're. I mean, because everybody knows as a GM, or hopefully they will learn or acquire the knowledge that you can manipulate canon in your own to, at your own table to to help support what you're trying to do or you know what your characters want to achieve but when you're writing a book and you're creating and or canon i think is what i'm looking a little more for Gotcha. So, so for establishing the canon itself, essentially, yeah. from that end. Um, so I, I get it really depends on what role I'm looking to have that particular character fill. Um, I'll give an example with the uh, the Samson Source book, which we, by the way, we got the Kickstarter coming out for that soon. We got the, the sign up for it available. Um, there's one particular character that I had a blast writing for him in there, and he's just, he's a marginalized character. Um, so he's only in there to give commentary and, and you know put a little bit of context on some of the things. It, it, you know, if you've read the books, you'll see where we put the the margin characters in there, and they just kind of help flesh out the world a little bit more because you'll get this big wall of text that that comes through from the whole description, whether it's you know in character or just you know writing about the game description. Uh, 
that and then we'll throw in a, a, a character from in game that gives you a little quote and sometimes it's a counterpoint, sometimes it's you know just something snarky where we're just throwing a joke in there. There's tons of those. Uh, and then sometimes there's ones where it expands upon the point a little bit more. Uh, mm-hmm. I have one particular character where I wanted to, it, 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 the way he played out, he's very much based off of Quark from Deep Space Nine. He's so much, the, because so much of the Samsut, they are very practical. They, they they put a an actual practical value on life because they trade it like a commodity. <laughs> so they come from that sort of a background. So I wanted to put something with that sort of a practical transactionary spin on it and what who better to do that than a Ferengi <laughs> so I took that concept and a lot of his quotes are just modified rules of acquisition that I'll put in there but so I made, ended up uh, you know just throwing the quotes in there at first and then I started to flesh out the character a little bit more as okay well he's going to you know we got to figure out how is he getting in to describe this to the British and as, as the story develops You'll see a little bit more and more as the uh, as the book goes on, where he throws a little bit more information about stuff that he's done and people he's traded with, and, and so it, uh, you know, where the elements have come up. So he's I gave him the background where he's a trader. He's based off of you know selfish desire. The British paid him to to come and give commentary on this book that they were putting together about their their opponents, their enemies, and so he'll talk about some of the trade deals that he's made with other people and his visits to other cities and and oh yeah no, they're 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 uh, people but they make a terrible ale uh, that sort of a thing and just throwing those commentaries so I, I I like I said I found the role that I wanted him to fill and then I fleshed in the backstory to help. Uh, bring that into being and to help kind of, you know, it gives it that element of fun, but it gives you something more solid to tie into the game line. So Mr. Pink has a question that's not backstory, but kind of, I mean, it's a cultural backstory. Um, the Samstead are not nice people. I remember that. And I know that they have like zombie undead control stuff. The 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 Samson yes uh, were and, and before I, more or less the bad guys. They they are the antagonist side of the war, yes. At least so, for, from how it's being presented. I was pretty sure they have a caste system. Do they yes. actually have actual slaves, or is it just a very strict caste system? No, yeah, they don't have. Well, it depends on how you think about it. Uh, as far as living people are concerned, no, they do not have actual slaves. They have a extremely low tier caste who are uh, basically they're you know doing the grunt work, but they're still considered free citizens. The, uh, so they, they are not you know put in, into basic- slave labor. They are considered to have a life debt, which everybody does because they have their technology that allows them to directly pull life energy into mana and, and put it into the batteries that they use to power their undead, power their machines, power their guns, and to make the the acolytes who are the, the upper cast above them, make them immortal and extend their lives. Basically, they're the untouchable class. The untouchable. Sort of, yes. Kind of. The, 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 they're, they're the dregs, the drones, the, you know, the, the lower people. So they're not slaves, but they... Uh, you know, comparing to how certain slaves lived in certain cultures on Earth, you may not be able to tell too much of the difference. Hi, Hobbs. Hobbs joined. So, it sounds like for that character you're talking about, that it actually was really the motivation and then the backstory. Mm hmm. So yep, the chicken yeah, before the egg. Yep. Yeah, figure. Well, I figured out the role I wanted him to play. Then I figured out what would motivate him to put him in that role, and then figured out the backstory to fit that. And therefore, creating canon. Yes. And canon is good because that's how we have books. I like books. Um. I had a question, but I lost it, Lady Six. It's been a very long day. That's okay. I have one. Okay. Um, 
So I like it as a GM because it makes my life easy because I don't have to think about it very much. When I have a player come to me and say, hey, I'd like as part of my backstory to meet this person or have this person or thing or being attached to me. Makes my life easy. They basically are coming up with that NPC thing or person or beast or whatever. Um, do you, as GMs and creators, writers, whatever, do you enjoy um, doing that or do you look, prefer to come up with all of that um, on your, by yourself and on your own? For me, going, yeah. I was going to say, for me, I love it when my players have ideas that help build the world. Absolutely love it. Um, I will say, I think some players are better at it, and I think some tables do better with it. Um, I so I find that newer players and players that I don't know how to put it but that they struggle with it because they think that they're not allowed to and getting them past that hump of, I only control my character and I have no say over anything else. It's hard. I think most GMs like it when players, Hey, what if there was, could there be things like that? But I do think that a lot of times players have a hard time getting over the idea that they don't have a say that that's all just in the GM land. Agency is awesome. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Mr. Pink is now in charge of my brain and talking for me. There you go. What Mr. Pink says is what I'm trying to get to, but it's taking too long. How about you, Mr. Pink? Since you answered so well for me. No, I, I, I think that's what I'm going to say. And you keep going. How about I keep going by passing it to Brad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tag Brad. I'm babbling. Fix it. So yeah, it definitely certain times people need yeah, you know, uh, like you say with like newer players. So there's that first hump where you gotta get them over need to influence certain things about the world. Then there's the second hump that I always run into where it is okay, now I need to give enough description so that this is useful. Uh, and that's, it, it's really something where it, you just, you know, get better at it with practice. Um, and it's just a matter of coaching them, them through that. And that's where you have, you know, your out, outside of the table talks where, okay, I want to have, you know, such and such NPC. This is my, my, you know, my master who trained me. This was, my, you know, these are my parents. This is my brother, you know, wherever, you know, perfect. Yes. Give me all of that that you want to write. That's relevant to your character. Give me plot hooks to anchor to. Absolutely. But I need a, a you know, it, it's just a matter of give me a little bit about who they are, what their motivation is, where they come from, and exactly in, in that story is you know, you know, give me a little bit here that we can tie it to. And it's it, it's really it's a conversation. It's not you tell me and then I put it in. It's let's have a dialogue. Let's go back and forth and figure out. You've got this idea. We, you'll, you'll give me a couple of things to anchor it to. Okay, I had this plot thread, this plot thread, and this plot thread, so I can tie them in here. I'll give you a little bit uh, to tie it to from there. And you have that conversation back and forth to help build the world. Wait, like adults having adult discussions and compromising and coming up with stuff together? Crazy. Yep, exactly. <laughs> crazy. I don't know. That might sounds like crazy talk to me. How about... I will throw in... I, I will throw in. I had some fun ones with my back in the day uh, when I was had when I ran an Earthdawn campaign, and I had players there. They love to in, throw in interjections for non-named NPCs and just throw <laughs> throw it a little bit for there. It was usually just stuff to be funny. I was totally cool with it. I'm, I'm like, yeah, no, this is derail the plot and you got something where we can throw in that'll just make it you know a joke or, or something interesting yeah go, go ahead and throw that in so uh the example i had this is early on in the campaign the group had started out uh in glenwood deep and they ended up going down towards kratos 
Uh, they picked up some other people along the way as they're going there. One of the, the group that they they picked up as one of the player characters was a uh, troll Beastmaster. And he had no information about the world. It, uh, he As soon as I said something about it, you know, was describing the different trolls, and he's like, okay, I the, be, play the troll sounds cool. And I talked about the different clans. As soon as I got to the Blood Lords, he's like, oh, yeah, no, I'm, that, I'm there. Uh, he didn't see, he didn't even care about the rest of it. He's just like, I love that name. I'm good. So, okay, cool. We'll give you that. And then we went over the disciplines. So he ended up choosing to be a beast master. As they're coming back, they, they finish their mission down in Kratos and they're making their way back to Glen, towards Glenwood Deep, big open plains. And there's a group of scorchers as tends to happen every so often. And, and again, he doesn't know about the world, so I'm trying to describe this in terms that they would understand, but I don't think he quite got it, that this is basically the mafia coming through and demanding that you pay them for protection uh, as they escort you across the plains. But so the, the, there's the group that is going to bring you to the chief to negotiate safe passage, and he notices that they're riding Thunder Beasts. And he goes up to the guy who has just, the mafia, essentially the scripting that was just captured them. He just goes, hey, when we're done with this, do you happen to sell those Thunder Beasts? And the guy stares at him and just gives this massive grin. It's like, sure, yeah, come, to, come see me after you talk to the chief. So we go through, we did the, the, the conversation there. And he's all excited because he's thinking he's going to get one of these Thunder Beasts. And we get done with the conversation with the chief, and then, of course, I, I was hoping he'd get into the role play and forget about it, because because uh, I, I didn't want to, you know, dash the guy's hopes. And, oh, and, come on, you know, the Completely, because oh, he he was going to end up with nothing to his name. <laughs> but we get into we get through this the, the conversation with the chief, and, then, and I think the other players picked up where I was coming from. But he just won't drop it. He asked the chief, "So where was the nice man who brought us in?" He, he uh, you know, I wanted to speak with him again. And one of the, my favorite guys, David, jumps in as one of the the guards for the chief and goes, "Who, Jim? No, we don't talk about Jim. He keeps trying to sell all our thunder beasts." <laughs> <laughs> it kept the session and he dropped it for their vote. But then Jim's used Thunder Beasts became an ongoing meme throughout the campaign where you'd have a Thunder Beast that had like a, you know, one that was just stuffed, one that had like a wooden leg. <laughs> it's just like a shady used car dealer. Kind of puts me in mind of the Simpsons monorail. Basically, yes. That, that is like, essential. Know, Thunder Beast instead. That is essentially the situation he was in, and he did not realize that, oh, they were going to take him for everything he had. Well, now you just need a Leonard Nimoy type to step in and go, well, another crisis averted. <laughs> <laughs> That's essentially what we had. <laughs> okay, so I have a question that I thought of, because I know of at least one situation where this worked in my favor, but it seems kind of counterproductive. But have you ever worked in a situation where you kind of purposely didn't give a character a backstory um they just had a motivation and went from whenever they met forward and you kind of you know at the mystery guest you never know what where they're from you just know they have dumped a dump or something like that I, i'm bad unless it's a major character npc i don't actually usually do backstories i have motivations and then if the players engage with that NPC for whatever reason, then I'm like, oh, I better figure out who they are, where they came from, what they want. You know, well, I know what they want. That's the motivation. But I better figure out that backstory. And sometimes it's nice, fun, or maybe easier to let how their interactions go decide the backstory. It's kind of like if everybody <laughs> thinks they're a, if everybody thinks that they're a monster, either you yeah, they're really a monster to give them that cookie or they're actually angelic and just incompetent because they're so convinced it's a monster type of thing. So you let them build the character for you. I, I, I kind of let them decide whether they realize they're deciding or not. It's, it's the, the GM trick of actually they have it all. They're all, I just let them think that they figured out my evil plot. 
players love it when they think they figured out your evil plot, even though you're like, I didn't have an evil plot. I was waiting for you guys to decide what was happening. Cool. <laughs> you're almost sitting there behind the screen, just like, holy shit, holy crap, that's a really great idea. Yes. <laughs> What'd you and, just say? Nothing. <laughs> uh, oh, here's the thing. That group brain is almost always better than the individual. So letting them come up with their theories and letting that help form things. I'm telling you, my players have always come up with better stuff than I come up with. The trick is, is letting them think that they were smart enough to figure out my evil plot when I'm just sitting there waiting for them to tell me what my evil plot was. How about you? Like when we give, like when we give the evil Faye Mouse a gun. You know, I, I can't see how that'll bite you guys at all. He 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 he. The idea of giving a fey mouse a gun, that just seems like the highlight of an entire session. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I will say when I'm writing for a thing in, in running a game, if I give the character a name, I have at least a backstory in mind. I may not set it in stone. And if the players come up with something suitable where we can modify and change and I need to, you know, I, I need to throw some extra layers and that sort of thing, I'll make their backstory multiple choice. And I, I will change that and call an audible later on. So one of the questions that I have for you, Brad, is do you have situations where you may personally have that written up, but you don't? release that information, you publish it or give it to your players or and stuff like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, if I give a character a name, I have some sort of backstory in my head. Whether or not that gets told to players or put in publishing or anything like that, I you know, the the depends on the circumstances. But they you know there a lot of that may not ever get revealed. And part of that is so that I could decide later on down the road I may want to change it. You know, I'm, I may pull an old man Henderson where I have a backstory of doom and part of that is what it reads. So that part of that is so that I can go in and make changes later on. That That's kind of a, a side question to this. Have you ever had a backstory and then feel like you really want to put it into the game, but they haven't taken the, they're, they're not taking the bait. And it's sometimes like, but I came up with this awesome backstory. Why are you guys not paying attention to the character so I can tell you the awesome backstory? Have you ever had that happen? Oh, I think every yes. I think every GM's run into where you you come up with the the I, you know the backstory, the plot threads, the character, and then the characters just you know, the players just pass it up. What's that's the, where it goes into my my folder of uh, facts to be used at a different date with a different character. Because if I think it's that cool, I'm going to use it at some point. Darn it. And I have uh, sometimes, I mean, I had a D&D &D character backstory that I ended up manipulating to run in a Shadowrun game because I loved that, that backstory so much. I just was going to use it. <laughs> and so it what was the backstory? Because cool. I think this, let, what was that one backstory that was so, so cool? Everybody. The backstory for this character was she was a female character that lost a bet with her brother. And the bet was that she could not go out and have an adventure that would be better than anything that had happened, more excited than anything that had happened to him because he'd been off to war. Well, what he didn't tell his sister was he was on the cooking crew he never saw any action. He was a putz, a lying putz. But she wandered through all this stuff. And she always kind of is the first little, she does this little daredevil thing of, oh, I will volunteer for that. That sounds exciting. And at the end of it, after she survived and has done something kind of crazy, right? She kind of sits back and does this whole, I don't know, I don't think that was exciting enough. I can't go home yet. But she takes side jobs as like barmaid for a while, or she takes a side job as, you know, a, a seamstress. Or so she's really easy to fit into all these little nooks and crannies of 
you walk into a storefront and boom. But her backstory is that, and she made a great character to, you know, I'm doing this. I need a bunch of guys. You know, originally she was supposed to lead them into a dungeon. Well, that didn't happen in Shadowrun. They ended up going after a corp instead. But it was a really cool backstory. <laughs> Love it. How about you, Brad? What's that one backstory that you just had to? Oh, try to think of a specific example, and I don't know of any off the top of my head that I've, I have ended up reusing. I have a collection of them that I'll hang on to, and I don't really want to reveal those because I end up using them in, in writing later. <laughs> so I, I know I have some that I can throw out at some point. I, I'm having a hard time thinking of an example of one that I've already used. Oh, come on, Brad. You could Easter egg it. Someone at some point will be like, oh my gosh, I remember that bad story. We, we it was like on Easter eggs. Podcast. Oh, what's one that I could use? <laughs> I'll have to think on it because I'm. Right, you think for a minute. Pink Cobbs. This is weird. So, like, C has dot, 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 and I don't know his actual, their actual name. Just says C dot dot dot. Um, Thomas R. Hark. You can just call me Hark. Hark. So I'm a friend Pink, of Hobbs. Is. Hobbs Hark. Do you guys have a backstory that was just so cool you you couldn't let it go? I actually I had one that was so cool that I didn't want to let it go, but the campaign ended before I could do anything with it. Those bastards. I was, uh, <laughs> it was, yeah, I know, right? It was a it was a dark heresy campaign, and. Um, I was also playing a character because it was only like three people and I had to control two people because we really needed a fourth. And the fourth guy was the silent manservant of the main person I was controlling and was kind of, um, what do you call it? Kind of a, uh, well, I can't remember the name of the butler from Batman. Alfred I'm to Pennyworth. Do, right? Alfred Pennyworth. Yeah, kind of an Alfred Pennyworth type in that he was like, relatively refined very quiet and off to the side but also a complete and total badass when need be so like he i i had him i had him like four levels ahead of the rest of us because my intention was essentially worst case scenario we're all about to die it's a tpk moment this guy can just come in guns a blazing and rescue everyone but no one knew that i had done that but we had never we never got into a situation where i needed to have this guy just like kick down the door and start shooting bolt pistols at cultists and i was always really disappointed that i didn't get to have my like hero moment with him because i put a lot of work into it he was like a he was like a former demon host or something like that some like really deep dark backstory to him that you know he just sort of ended up being this guy's batman unentirely intended how about you hobbs oh Oh, Mr. Pink posted that he did not really have one yes. in, in things. So I don't know if Hobbs is going to respond. I will say upon you mentioning the, uh, you know, your Alfred character, I did have one that I, I had thought of, and it was really mostly just from the name. Um, this was actually back when Chris and I were playing through Star Wars The Old Republic. And at one point we, we made new characters, and I made a Imperial agent. And we were trying to decide, you know, as you're in the character design, I'm trying to figure out how I want this character to, to play out. Chris told me, you know, he's a spy, so make him as British as possible. So I gave him the design where he had, he had the mutton chops, he had a slash over his eye, uh, he, he wore an eye patch, and uh, he went by the name Wessington was as British as I could possibly think to make it. And I said, at some point, he's going to end up after he retires. So if you ever see a character named Wessington in the books, that might be one. That's where his reference comes from. I turned on my microphone to tell you that I've not actually played a tabletop or DM'd anything in decades. I'm just a fan. I don't have the time Let because of play. music and PC builds and... Oh. I used to play BattleTech and uh, Warhammer Forty Thousand. See, you got to play. I tried to get play. him to do a couple of RPGs, but you know he's fiddly. <sighs> Quit being fiddly. Come play RPGs with us. <laughs> yeah, I'm working you on it. Jesus. 
<laughs> kind of busy writing a few things. Okay, so I I have a question. I know that anytime I have to create a backstory, I do your classic who, what, where, when, why. Like I have to answer all of those to have a complete backstory. Do you guys have a formula or specific way that you guys like to come up with a backstory, or do you just like ponder it till it smacks you in the face? I can lend insight as far as my writing. Okay. And I do sort of, it's, it's, it goes a lot with, um, I have the same technique with songs as I do with like writing fiction or anything. A lot of times I will, it, with songs, I will start mostly with like a chorus or, a, or like a riff. And that translates to my writing style because I will choose, I'll choose like, music in order to make my my stories sort of feel a certain way. And in in the book that I'm writing, I have several instances where the main character is listening to music and it's sort of you picture it. And even if you don't know, you know, what that song is, you can sort of I'm actually like writing out lyrics and things like that and like for, okay, so you know well, ones for what like, I'm hearing like me. is your books and, and characters have a playlist. Yeah. And that is how you come up with the backstory. Yep. Okay. And it's also how I, like, I, I will write defining moments in the books or the stories. Okay. I don't know how that works for your the, the who, what, when, where, and why thing. The why is, you know, I'll that to me be would inspiration be a... from a movie or something. Yeah, but that that I could like see that I could see someone coming up with a song or something and going, now this is what I'm going to base, you know. And I, in my real life, I carry on my phone, my Spotify list is my own personal. Yeah. My friends, so, all my friends think I'm kind of weird when I'm gardening. One of the, one of the chapters that I'm writing, and uh, Andy, you've, I don't know if you read any of the stuff that I sent, but one of the chapters that I'm writing, I put in a, in a vertical slice and the main character is literally listening to one vision by queen. He's like, he's obsessed with like 20, 20, 20, 21st century pop culture. So he's listening to one vision when he's about to kick some Davy on patoot. <laughs> so, so what about you, Andy? What do you, do you have something? What I was going to say is, is that, I mean, I think the inspiration can strike from anywhere, but when we're talking about songs, um, there's a song called take me to church. And the first oh, time yeah. I heard it, all I could think of is is a drow priestess sacrificing a, you know, younger male relative that's <laughs> not of value because he's male and he doesn't have magic and all that. And what would happen if it was interrupted and he feels like he was supposed to be sacrificed because he's a true believer, but then it was interrupted. And so maybe that's what Lolth wanted. And it turned into this wonderfully convoluted backstory for this npc that was so much fun and the players loved him so see I, I hear that song and i immediately think of like a cleric that's been good the entire time and finally has a moment where he has to break the rules a little bit like walking through the rain ready to kill somebody because he needs to kind of a thing there is something about that song that is just a great muse that like even if you don't have the same vision that i have it's just it's a very powerful song and it's a good muse. Tiptoe through the tulips by Tony Tim. I actually, I have, I have an uh -huh. answer for this one too, as well. This question is, I, I, uh, I start with a line. You know, you, you think of a, a okay, really we're not good doing drugs. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, but like, um, like the, I, I wrote a novel and the, the tagline of the novel it's, is actually the line that I developed the character around. And it was, uh, my name is Gordon Locke and I kill people for a living and everything just kind of like flowed from that concept. So, you know, you know doing like who, what, where, when, and why it's, it's the line that kind of encapsulates everything I want that character to represent. You know, I don't know if I ever told you this, but that, that, that very first line, it reminded me of um, the, the first line in Serenity when Malcolm just goes, what was that? I don't know why it did, but it, it always does. 
when I think of that line. Oh, I feel so boring with who, what, where, when, and why when you guys are like. <laughs> okay, I don't think that's boring. You're I think like it's better like, organized. Like a little, like, <laughs> See, I think it's better organized. But it, it leads me to the <laughs> idea of that they have a lot of um, books for NPCs. Um, roll, you know, a D20 and pick this thing for an NPC. When you get time crunched, what's your go-to NPC crutch for history and things like that? Do you have one? Is there a, a an NPC book or an NPC generator or something that you like? What's the question again? When you're in a time crunch, what is the mm. NPC background creator that you like? I know that there are several companies that have books of NPCs that you can still that have backgrounds and everything. There's a lot of uh, NPC, like, what's it called? Where you roll a D20 and you take that and that's part of your NPC's background, that type of thing. Uh, I know that there's some online well, ones. That's like some Battle Lords, Shadowrun kind of stuff right there. Yeah, I've, I've never really used anything like that. I think really? I, I have. Time crunch, I, was just I have, like, yeah, I have time all crunch those. Or something, Oh, sorry, I have later. cast. I have all those uh, cr creature casting books and all those NPC casting books. I have tons of that kind of stuff. I do too. And I I don't I, use them that much, but I, I have to roll it. I don't. I, but I love them because what it gave me after I read them, and I, I occasionally go back in and re look through, is a the art is awesome, and I, I find I steal like the art um, for a character a lot more than I do the actual character. But what I what I what it led me to is what I call my tropes, my classic tropes, the adventurer, the thief, the, you know, um, the classic backstory of the village was destroyed and I'm the only survivor, you know, that kind of stuff, because you'll find that a lot of those different things in those books, they just change like. Well, my planet was destroyed instead of my village or my, you know, whatever. My my family abandoned me. Or, my uncle you know, was whatever. killed by a thief. Right. Exactly. I love... My cell used Thunder Beast. I think that the problem <laughs> is, is it's it's me and the... I like the ones where I roll some dice and then that's an aspect of the character, of the NPC. And I don't know that I use them very often, but there's something about rolling that and it creating the character that amuses me. And maybe it's my dice fascination. I don't know. Known to pick up 20, 20 ciders and roll them. And whatever that is, is it's what my character is. is. Yeah. It, and, and sometimes you end up with these things, these guys that are like totally like, it makes no sense. But when you start playing them and you play them true to whatever they rolled, I they kind of develop this weird quirky personality and it works because there are these weird strange people on the planet occasion i think it also know? helps with some kind of creative as far as well how do i make that work and sometimes just trying to get that creative juices flowing i think is helpful um what about you brad I've never used any of those no? tools or anything like that. Generating. I feel like the no, worst, no, laziest I, GM now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I will meticulous to use those tools. Well, it's more just because I, and it's and again, it's how my mind puts everything together. I think story first. So if I have, I figure out story, I figure out role, I figure out who I want to play that particular role. It, the that's kind of going the opposite direction where you're rolling up random character traits or you know fi finding something there and then you're know, figuring out how they fit into the existing story i i think you know the kind of top down versus bottom up approach and neither one's wrong at all it's just you know different methods of tackling the problem I mr think pink is that. somewhat correct on that last comment but i will also say I've, I'm going to be in Texarkana this weekend playing Singing Dancing Monkey and running 1879. And all of the NPCs I used our, our um, AI art generator and argued with it and cursed at it and a few other things, but eventually came up with a reasonable image that I could put in front of the players and be like, they look alike this. 
because I can't draw anything but illicit stick figures and I I need help. <laughs> so What's whereas it can't I count what an illicit stick and it, figure is. It, look, it, it can't and count, it doesn't words. know English and it hates me. It's still better than my illicit stick figures. So uh, what hey, is an illicit me, stick figure? <laughs> okay, illicit stick I can answer this one. Illicit stick figures require glitter and detrius from your yard to complete there's some of that there's also technically there's the position of the stick figures and you know the third leg on some <laughs> of the stick figures and the random giant circles on a few stick figures look yes. i i have offered ross more than once that i would do the entire book's art for earth dawn for 1870 just it'll just be illicit stick figures for the whole thing i mean like i can make I them I've play a role playing game if all of the artwork was just illicit. I told her that she should try to get one together as a as a to make money to rate for a find a good cause, do an illicit stick figure drawn book, and I all the money think, goes to that. But I, don't I know. think oh, that'd be awesome. I think if we just did it in PDF, I might have a chance. If we try to get it printed, Ross would lose his mind and yell it at probably me. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Oh no no! So the pinups, Mister Pink. If you don't know that one, if you, you've never heard the story, for one of the Kickstarters, somebody said something, and it rent into this running gag that there was going to be a pinup contest between me. You were the okay. So yeah, between yeah, and I lost. I've lost every one against James. There's only been two, but I've lost both. But mine was in color, and his wasn't. But yeah, we did a pinup war. So you've seen my pinup. I did a great job. I thought it had Ool had red stiletto heels. Booyah. Like who doesn't want Ool and red stiletto heels? <laughs> I know you lady, Ulo you haven't Star seen them. What? I haven't. No, Ool as in, go ahead, Andy, tell oh. them who Ool is. So Ool is a character in Earth Dawn who has been the leader of Iopos, which is probably not the nicest of nations. And he'd been around for a very long time. And we did a couple of books that were linked. We did the Iopos book. And then we did a book called Empty Throne. Ool is killed. And during one of the Kickstarters, it, it turned into this ongoing choke, which has become an ongoing play war between me and the wonderful, talented, ever so smart James, who is the um, art director for Earth Dawn. I keep losing. I thank you. My I red stiletto heels, dude. I was I was rocking this. Red stiletto heels on stick figures look like number fours, by the way. So <laughs> my art's not good. So I need an AI because I can't art. And she that I would take that picture and that would be the backstory that I could run with. I will figure out something <laughs> awesome to put a backstory to that. So all right. This is we've, sticky. He's a two dimensional planar being. <laughs> all right we've only got a few minutes here left to destroy all of you does anybody have an interdimensional or if we're talking about like interdimensionals like you have to have like an instance where like this the stick death super beast makes an appearance and just terrorizes <laughs> everything and then just leaves just, and just, just like mic drop boom mic drop boom i'm out wouldn't that just be a stick death? what is this doodle bob from spongebob squarepants <laughs> I was gonna say, wouldn't that just be wouldn't, like the the ultimate, wouldn't like the ultimate death beast just be like a giant eraser? I would like I all of you to know that this is what happens on a podcast when a bunch of us haven't had enough rest. When do we ever get hey, enough I'm rest? I'm coming up with good questions okay. here. You are. You're doing fantastic. <laughs> Some of us are a little brain dead. Brad, we'll get enough rest when we secretly like gag and tie up Ross and put him in a closet for like two weeks and then we can all just take a nap I would like, like we should totally make an illicit stick figure of Ross tied up and gagged in the closet I should work on that uh, no, that my to-do list no 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 yeah huh no no no, no you don't understand so don't, Andy, oh no 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 I've done worse up. I've done worse I mean, I mean, Ask, I mean let's not judge what's the safe word so, <laughs> yes, we know you've done worse, no. Andy. That's the okay. problem. So, so do you remember <laughs> years ago when I first started some of the stuff around Halloween every year, I was doing a different company person as like a, a monster. And the first one was the Babcock. Oh. 
So, oh, you've got to find it. it sounds like that's. So Ross became the very first dirty. victim for the Halloween jokes. I need to get that back going again. And so there is an entire write up, stats and everything for the Babcock, who is a horror, who comes off like a it corporate dirty. guy. It's awesome. It sounds like an illicit stick drawing. <laughs> so the thing is, is that I am so surprised some days how I'm not fired. Like I, I remember one year St. Patty's Day was coming up and I was like, Ross never pays any attention. And I may or may not have been drinking 10% off everything with this code. <laughs> you, you should see Eric and I on Twitch. Holy wow. Oh, speaking really? of pictures and write-ups and stuff like that, I do have one last question that I'm going to ask, and then I won't ask any more for the evening. But my question is this. I like, as part of doing my backstories, to actually come up with, like, pictures of maybe their houses or clothing options or their favorite beer or something, drink or something like that. Do you guys go that far into your backstories, or do you just do a basic write-up? Huh? What? I'm sorry, I was talking to the wife. That's okay. <laughs> How deep do you go into your backstories? Do you know their favorite oh, drink? Hell. Do you know I'm what George their clothes Lucas. look like? Um, I, I am George Lucas. I uh, My solo music thing, after I got out of touring, I created this thing called The Toxic Dream, and it's basically like a Sonic movie series. I It was like heavy metal with like audio scenery in between them. And in my first album... I had like seven cast members and there was like 15 pages worth of lines that they all had to say. And I made my own sound effects and everything on volume two. There were 32 cast members and 150 pages of dialogue just for a heavy metal album. I, I am George Lucas when it comes to writing. <laughs> I feel like everybody's got a name. Everybody's got a face. Everybody's got a, like a phone number and everything. I'll be honest. I Batman don't have a history of not thinking things out. <laughs> I, I I don't unless oh, Lucas. for some reason that that particular NPC <laughs> has I don't know how to put like if I feel connected to the NPC or I'm just really interested in who this NPC is then I do but most of them no I don't I probably should Andy you know how we've done scrapbook your favorite character yes I, I do. have scrapbook I have scrapbooks of NPCs. Yeah. One of these days, maybe I'll set the camera back up and I will show some of you my uh, character scrapbooking because I think it is the coolest and best pretending I can do art thing ever. I got fancy scissors, scissors and, and pretty scissors and glue are our friends. It's like collaging your character sheet into a binder with a whole bunch of page protectors and Glitter glue. Everything needs glitter glue. Right, Brad? Glitter glue makes the world go round. <laughs> Thank and you. A trapper exactly. Keeper, apparently. Well, most of the Don't... stuff I do uses wood glue. But, you know. All right. We are. I mentioned these because glitter, gl glitter glue is about that old. I. Hey, so it still exists. And trapper keepers were awesome. Does it really? Take that. Trapper keepers were awesome. Yeah, glitter glue. I was I just using glitter one. glue when in my like in my war with that. James. Yeah. <laughs> I actually I have glitter glue on the shelf. What are you talking? <clears throat> but I'm childish. Well, it's next to like, my. We're talking about glitter glue, dude. It's it's my my sub teaching stuff is over there near my Legos. So yeah, glitter glue and Legos. That makes, that I'm makes an adult. A lot of sense. Based off of the illicit. Stick figures. I feel like glitter glue next to Lego makes a lot of sense. I think I shouldn't be a sub teacher. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> well, you could be a Dom teacher instead. <laughs> Isn't it Dom A? Isn't it Dom A? <laughs> just saying. Not that I know anything about that. <laughs> Not that I know anything about that. I was just, you know, just, I, I, we should be accurate. <laughs> we should be accurate, you know. Do, you know. Hey, I have a question. Do we have a talk next week? Sorry, you cut out for me. Try again. Do we have a topic for next week yet? Dame. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. We have um, one of the uh, Earth Dawn team is supposed to be with us. Let me see well, who it is. Apparently next Thursday is supposed to be Talk Like a Pirate Day. Is it? Is it really? Well, they're making me come into the day job so for it, so yes. 
Oh. <laughs> we be selling used Thunder Beasts here. here. We be selling used Thunder Beasts. I love that. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Oh I will tell you now, if podcast. it is talk like a pirate date, I will lose points for that one because I right. don't know if I'll have the brain. September to do that 19th one. is supposed to be Kyle. The theme is Kyle? Oh. No, oh, no, 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 that's Kyle's the guest. Kyle's one of our <laughs> Urton team. We should make it, we oh, should see if he'll is... talk like a pirate the whole time. <laughs> oh, the main thing is don't waste your time trying to teach a pirate the alphabet. Oh, here we go. At Kyle. Yeah. No, Next but I have enough dad jokes for triplets. Wait, hey, you're a puppy dad. You yeah, but Sonny doesn't laugh at my jokes. He does, you just can't hear it. It's an, it's an inner laugh. <laughs> but anyway, you don't t uh, try to teach pirate the alphabet because they always get lost at sea. Ha 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 ha. Oh. It's a, I love dad jokes. Dad it's usually dad funny horns, because yeah. somebody always tries to make an R joke, and then you throw the curveball. Lost at sea. <laughs> I'm surprised my dad never told me that one. He was Navy. Oh, oh you should tell so him. Maybe he doesn't know it. I don't Andy, think we have a theme. Uh, we, we've got Kyle. He's in Arlington right now, so... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was thinking about for tonight's podcast, actually. Do we have any more questions or if we kind of beat backstory to death? I think we're good. But you guys have all been awesome. You guys make this so much fun. Thank you. I'm glad, I, I'm glad it was a fun time. Agreed. I mean, you guys bring the party. Unless anybody wants, unless anybody wants the big boy pictures. I still plan on making a video of that at some point. Um, I, I want I have them. Pictures. But I have to finish getting ready for Texarkana. Well, here, I'll throw one up on the chat for you. Yeah, you know it's going to be in Arkansas this coming weekend. But I found out about that after I had agreed to do the convention. And I'm going to have a great time at the convention. But I kind of wish I well, could hey, like, take time off. Depending go. on what... Oh, wow. Well, depending on when the time works out, you may be able to catch it as she's, you know, heading back and then get to see her driving. So Texarkan, I think, is about four or five hours from where it's supposed to be. So probably not. But are you, <clears throat> are you taking the babies with you? No, plans changed and the babies are being babysat. They're all in uh, Nixa. Being oh. babysat. Too sad. Well, um, they've uh, the two youngers, the two littles, uh -huh. Batsy and Dragon, have been very yeah. amorous towards each other and bounce play. So uh, just in case, it. we want them to feel very. Smart move. I don't think we the convention's romantic. How about that? I don't think we the convention. Probably. We should let this go. Because <laughs> we've somehow gone from Dame, so sorry, no, sorry, illicit stick figures to Dame's to dog porn. I think I think we're done. I think that's it. I think, good night. Well, well, then we're going to get to illicit dog stick figures. Wonderful. <laughs> look, look, look. Thank you we for want a baby. We Thank want a baby. With us. All right. Everyone say goodbye, and I'm going to stop the recording. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.